Well, hello English 111 students. This is Dr. Tinsley, and we are continuing our remote learning environment, our distance learning environment for the remainder of this spring 2020 semester. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm starting to see a few folks fall off the radar screen, as it were, and I would just encourage you to continue pressing on, keep your noses to the grindstone. Let's finish out the semester strong. We've got our third and final essay coming up, so you're going to need to stay strong on all of this, okay? So don't slack off now. Let's keep it going. Uh, the remainder of the semester and the lectures that we're going to be doing are, uh, I'm sad that we can't do them together because they usually elicit a lot of great discussion. These are more critical thinking type of lectures. Um, but, you know, we'll do what we have to do, and uh, today, this week, is the art of visual persuasion. And again, I, I wish we could be together, because these are some really good discussions. Uh, but we will do the best that we can. Before I get going with this lecture, I will say, be very uh, cognizant of the email this week. Make sure you do everything that's stated in, uh, in the email. We are coming up on the end of the semester May 8th, your final draft of your final paper is going to be due, and so we need to keep driving toward that end. I'm going to have specific, a specific assignment for you to do this week, so I need you to make sure you stay on target, okay? So read your directions. Read the uh, week email for this week very, very carefully. Okay, let's get going with uh, the visual... The Art of Visual Persuasion, I'm going to skip through these uh, slides here because uh, we'll talk about these in uh, a later time. All right, so what we're going to do for Visual Persuasion today, and this is, again, we do this in a discussion format, but I'll just drive the discussion myself, is we're going to look at some photos, all right? So we know that persuasion, visual uh, aids can be very persuasive. Images can be very persuasive. So I'm going to, we're going to look at a few images here today, and we're going to ask some questions. Uh, what is the photo depicting in first place? What are the visual elements of persuasion in each photo? And what are the emotions uh, that the photographer is trying to conjure within the viewers? And the reason we're doing this, we're going to show through this that visual imagery can be very complex and very, very persuasive. So let's look at these. And uh, I asked the question, then, what is this? And some students know this is a photo from the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, this was taken from the back of a, of a Jeep or some kind of vehicle as the photographer was driving away. And I ask, what are... What this is a and this was one of the most powerful and popular, famous, I should say, photos from the Vietnam War, and the question is why is this so uh, famous? Why did this gain so much notoriety, as it were? Uh, of all the photos that were taken in Vietnam, why is this one of the top ones? This was a, a cover of Newsweek magazine back in uh, when it was first taken, and the question is why. And first, most students initially notice the poor naked uh, girl in the, you know, virtually the center of the photo. Uh, it's a stark thing, isn't it? I mean, we don't like to see nudity, especially in children, especially in children under distress. This is not something that's normal. It's not something that's comfortable. And so we notice that. And so that makes this a very stark and a very compelling photograph. We look at the faces of the other children. Uh, and they're crying. They have a lot of fear in their faces. One, the child in the back is looking back. And so just very, we see these, uh, 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 just the stress, the distress in these children's lives. And we do not like to see that, right? Then we contrast that to the soldiers that are in the background. And first of all, we see the faces of the children, but we don't see the faces of the soldiers, right? The soldiers are kind of blank faces. That's because they're at a distance. But in this photo, we can't make out their facial features. So they're kind of this nameless band, right? Uh, they're also very dark compared to the children. Children are wearing lighter colors for the most part. The soldiers are wearing darker colors. The children are fearful. It looks like it's just another day in the office for the soldiers. Um, 
there's a couple soldiers looking back as the child is looking back, and they're, they're all looking back towards this black smoke in the background that conceals what's even going on in the background of this photo. But it's almost, we know it's some kind of destruction, some kind of burning, that type of thing. And so we've got these people walking out of destruction, out of this burning. Some are fearful, the children. Some seem like it's not a big deal, the soldiers. So the contrasts in colors, the contrasts in emotions, the contrasts in age. you got adult soldiers, children, uh, American soldiers. you got Vietnamese children. All of these contrasts, and I mean stark contrasts, are really what, are drive, what drives, uh, in so many ways, the popularity and notoriety of this photo. Why was it so popular? Well, these are some of the reasons. And, of course, there are many, many other reasons that I won't go into here. But do you see the persuasiveness of this simple image? It's amazing, isn't it? Visual uh, imagery can be very compelling. Why do we try to learn this in this class? Why are we going through these photos? Because I want you to see that the things we look at can very much influence us. And so uh, next time you look at a billboard, next time you look at a magazine ad, next time you look at something on the Internet, remember, somebody is probably trying to persuade you. How are they doing it? That's what you want to ask yourself. How are they doing it? How are they trying to uh, motivate me to take some action or stop some action? Because that's critical thinking. And that will allow us to know what we're doing before we do it so that when we uh, make decisions in life, we're making them for the right reasons. Okay. I know I'm talking fast, but let's keep going. Next picture. What is this? That's right. This is a photo from the Apollo 11 moon landing, 1960, July of 1969. Uh, I, I usually ask, who is this? And everybody says, Neil Armstrong. And I say, eh, wrong. It's not Neil Armstrong. This is Buzz Aldrin. They say, how do you know that? And I say, well, uh, because Neil Armstrong was the only one that had the still camera. And so it had to be Neil Armstrong that took... The picture. And if he was taking the picture, who's the other person? Buzz Aldrin. Well, Neil Armstrong is actually in this picture, though. If you look in the visor of Buzz Aldrin there, you'll see a little, in the middle of his visor, you'll see a little white, looks like a figure. Well, that is Neil Armstrong as he's taking the picture. So what creates, this was one, this has been become one of the most famous pictures from the uh, NASA Apollo program. And yes, well, why? It's just an astronaut standing on the moon. Well, first of all, it's an astronaut standing on the moon, right? So uh, that was a big deal when this was taken. It's still a big deal in, uh, in U.S. history. But beyond that, there were a lot of pictures taken uh, of astronauts on the moon uh, in the, in the uh, uh, six Apollo landings. So what makes this one so compelling, so persuasive, as it were. And we oftentimes talk about the starkness in you got the gray dead background and you got the white living astronaut. So there's a contrast there. Um, uh, of course, it's an astronaut standing on the moon. It's the first thing you've got the uh, in the foreground there, you got the um, uh, all the footprints from the astronaut spacesuit, and then in the background, there's nothing. So you've got Evidences of life in the foreground, evidences of no life in the background. Um, you've got lighter colors of the moon and the astronaut as opposed to the stark darkness of space beyond. Um, and then we also talk about the American flag on the astronaut's left shoulder. Uh, this is a, If the astronaut's arm was not in the left arm was not in the position that it's in right now, you wouldn't see the American flag so clearly, but we see it now. Uh, in this position. That's important because America was the first to land on the moon. So it's almost like in this picture, we're declaring that we were the first to land on the moon. Look at the American flag. It's right there in front of you. We are the ones. The astronaut suit also has a lot of red, white, and blue on it. America, the colors of our flag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This picture was popular for all of these reasons, right? Uh, and many, many more. I'm not going to go into all of them, but you get the idea. Let's go to the next picture. One of my favorite pictures. This is a um, famous picture from baseball history, one of the most famous. Again, we're talking, why is this so compelling? And I asked the question, who is this? 
And everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people say, well, it's Babe Ruth. And I say, yeah, you're right. How do you know it's Babe Ruth? And it's because of the number three in the pinstripe uniform, the pinstripe Yankee uniform number three. We know that's Babe Ruth. And also, if you know anything about Yan- old Yankee Stadium, you can see, uh, based on the, um, uh, the flourishes and the way the stadium's constructed, that this is the old Yankee Stadium. So we kind of know the context And then I'll elaborate a little bit further and tell you that this is from the end of Babe Ruth's career. And I say, how do we know that? And they say, well, he looks older, um, but he's also leaning on his bat. It looks like he's using his bat as a crutch. You can tell he's kind of leaning forward. The bat's on the ground there. So it's almost like he's using the bat as a crutch. And I ask the question, well, why is this picture taken from the rear? Why not take it from the front? And then we talk about the fact that If we take it from the front, we see the old Babe Ruth. But if we take it from the rear, we see the iconic Babe Ruth, the number three in pinstripes, right? Because look at if you look to the right of Babe Ruth, there there are two or three other photographers in this photo uh, who are taking pictures. Their photos never made it into the history books. Whoever the photographer is that's taking the one that we see did. And I'm a firm believer it's because... It was taken from behind. We see the iconic Ruth, not the old Ruth. And we also, if you'll notice, this picture is being taken from a low angle. In other words, the photographer's probably down on a knee, just like the photographer's to the right. And it's almost like he's taking, well, he is taking the picture in an upward trajectory, which means Babe Ruth looks like a giant. Do you see that? It's almost like he is larger than life. He's tall. And if you look in the stands, the stands are full, the fans are there. Ruth, though the other Yankees are probably to Ruth's left just out of frame, we don't see them, do we? So it looks like Ruth is standing alone. So he's a giant standing alone. We see the iconic three. We see the iconic pinstripes. Do you see what's going on here? We are being made to see Ruth as the historical figure, the baseball great, not as the human being. Folks, this is a beautiful example of visual persuasion at its best. Don't miss it. When people are trying to persuade you, they will manipulate the imagery just like this to make you see what they want you to see. And folks, if you aren't aware of that, you will see what they want you to see and you may not think critically about it. I want you to think critically. So pick apart images like this, okay? And again, we could talk about many, many other things. Let's go to another one. And everybody says, this is the Mona Lisa. And you're right, it is. Uh, Famous Da Vinci painting, right? And we say, well, why is this so popular? And people will say, well, you know, it's because of uh, she's considered one of the most beautiful women at the time. And I say, okay, that's good. Um, We also talk about the colors in this original painting would have been much much brighter and much more vibrant than they are in this old painting painting right where the colors have faded and darkened over time but then somebody will invariably say it's the smile right is she smiling is she not smiling and then it's the whole eye thing everybody knows that if you go to the left it looks like she's looking at you if you go to the right it looks like she's looking at you if you look and stand in the center of the photo it looks like she's looking at you if you go above the photo it looks like she's looking at you this is an intriguing photograph isn't it the debate whether she's smiling or not, the debate into who she is, who is this woman, Uh, all of these things have created historical intrigue that have captured our attention and have created um, this, uh, uh, just this whole history and interest in this painting. Uh, But it is a stark image. The background is very interesting. It looks like a a very much a Dante type of background, doesn't it? Uh, It's a lot of reds and oranges and darker colors uh, and and kind of a stark landscape uh, behind her. Here's this beautiful woman and not so beautiful landscape behind her. A lot of contrast. You'll notice contrast is big in visual arts um, and in art. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, all of these elements create interest in these paintings and these images, right? And then we get to this, and everyone goes, Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. And I love this painting because, again, it has so much persuasion in it. It has so many elements 
um, uh, that I want to try to pick apart, or some of which I want to try to pick apart in the next minute or two. But look at this. Uh, the, no, first of all, the, the colors are beautiful. I mean, this is a beautiful painting. I've seen this firsthand uh, over in the uh, the Netherlands. And uh, I can tell you this is a beautiful painting just by virtue of its colors. But it goes beyond that. Of course, Van Gogh was known for his short brush strokes and his waves. And we see that here. This is a night photograph. We see that we know that because of the darker blues that he used but also we see the lights on in the in the houses down in the little town there uh, we see the moon out we see the stars so we, we get this as a nightscape and we oftentimes think as night as being dead but van gogh doesn't want us to see night as dead here he's got the waves the air is moving right the mountains are almost like water waves there in the background and so this is an active thing um, we see the waviness of the tree there in the foreground which means probably given us the sense of wind. All of this has given us the sense of wind and movement and activity and life. Okay, so that's it's important to this, but let's focus on the town. And I usually ask the question, what's the centerpiece of this town? And most people will eventually get it and say the church. We see this church with this overly exaggerated steeple, right? And, uh, and I say, okay, great, so the church. And that wouldn't have been so, uh, in, in the time that this was painted, that wouldn't have been such... Um, uh, you know, maybe the churches aren't the centerpiece of our towns today, but back in the, these times, they were. And so the fact that the church is in the center wouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. But what might have been a surprise to folks is to see the contrast that I want to point out here. First of all, I say, what do we see in the houses around the church? And, everybody, and a lot of folks will say, well, it looks like there's there are lights on, right? And I say, yeah, there are lights on. So what does what do lights on in a house at night mean? They mean life. They mean activity. They mean those sorts of things. But look at the church. No lights. What does that tell us? Potentially, that the church may be the titular centerpiece of society. But there's no one home. There's no life. There's no activity. There's no vibrancy. Life is going on around it, but not in it. And folks, I do believe in my heart that Van Gogh was making a statement against the church, or a statement, I should say, maybe about the church in his time when he drew this painting. Do you see the persuasion? It's subtle, right? But it's there. And we have to be careful because sometimes persuasion is subtle in, in the arts and in imagery and in visual things. And so, folks, when you're out here and you're looking, pick apart the things that you see because you don't know there's more to than what meets the eye. Okay? So, uh, when we look at an image... We ask the question, what makes it appealing? What draws us in? It's some of the things we've already talked about, right? Color, contrast, uh, contrast we talked about a lot. Uh, perspective, how's, where is the image taken from? The starkness or the candor of the image, the simplicity. Sometimes simple things are more stark and more compelling than complex things. Uh, the significance, what's the significance surrounding? Like the Babe Ruth uh, photo, that was a significant baseball milestone you know so that that makes a difference the emotions that the image draws out the the appeal logical and otherwise that the that 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 the that the, that the, that the image draws on us and the credibility is it does it make sense and was it you know uh, maybe people in the image are they credible the person who took it credible is the situation credible etc so all of these things make things appealing but if somebody can get the color the contrast the perspective the starkness the simplicity the significance the emotion uh the logical appeal and the credibility right they can be very persuasive can't they but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you so you've got to understand these elements so that you can pick apart the things that you see and Use your critical thinking to drive your decision. Don't let your emotion drive your decision. Don't let your intuition drive your decision. Let your logic drive your decision making. Let your critical thinking do the driving. Okay, so <clears throat> that's really the point of this lecture. Marshall McLuhan, I think this is in, this is in your text, 
um, said this, we shape our tools and afterwards our tools shape us. All media works us over completely. It was a warning that he was making that we've got to be careful because media sources, images, things that we see on TV, reading magazines, newspapers, these, internet especially, right? Uh, these things do affect us and they can work us over in a good way or a bad way if we are not careful. And so folks, I want you to really take this lecture to heart and understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not saying eschew all media. What I am saying though is when you see the visual when you see images, when you see marketing, when you see media of all sorts, look at it with a critical eye. Don't just accept it and react. Look at it, analyze it, think about it critically, and then make decisions logically. Okay, that's really the point of today's lecture. So we're talking about critical thinking, all right? But we're also talking about essay three. So, um, uh, we, we, you were supposed to choose your proposal and put that in um, 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 Canvas this past week. Some of you did that. Many of you didn't. I need you to go ahead and do that because at the beginning of this week, I'm going to be looking at those and giving some feedback. And I want to be able to give you some feedback. And then this week, we're going to take it a step further and we'll be looking at an outline for your essay. So I need you to stick with me, okay? Stick with me. Um, and uh, again, I'll talk about all this in the email, but you got to stick with me if you want to be successful, okay? All right, that's all I have for this lecture today. Um, read that email, respond to the assignments, and let's get her done, all right? Talk to you soon. Bye now.